Um, so thanks everybody for for coming. Um, so we're gonna sort of have two presentations and then some discussion. Um, I'm gonna we're gonna talk about the Real Food Campaign for 2019 uh, and then plans for 2020. We'll describe a little about what it is um, and what we've done, what we've got so far for this year. Um, and then Dorn's gonna present about um, Open Team and the relationship with the Real Food Campaign. Um, and then we'll have time for a discussion at the end. So that's the plan. So first I'm just gonna talk about um, what the Real Food Campaign is, um, what our goal is, and uh, we've done this enough times now where there's pretty consistent common set of questions that people have about it. So I just wanna sort of hit those right off the bat and make sure that's clear. So the mission of the Real Food Campaign um, which uh, is primarily a partnership between the Biodutrient Food Association, and um, which, which does a lot of fundraising and the outreach and sort of you know, works with you guys in the community to ask the sort of core questions which drive the campaign about connections between uh, soil quality, food quality, and human health. And then um, uh, our side, which is a separate company that contracts a lot of the work. So we contract, we do all of the lab work, and then we do the technical development for the tool. Um, and that kind of stuff. So right now, that those are the primary people who are implementing the Real Food Campaign. Um, and the main, main goal is really just to bring transparency to the food supply as it relates to nutrient density. Um, so that, you know, we're not talking about proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. That's something that's pretty transparent at this point, but we're talking about um, density of things like vitamins and minerals um, and antioxidants and, and other types of things that, that may not be as apparent and that may have a lot more variation. So we're really, really trying to understand <clears throat> how much of that variation is and what's the sources of that variation. So, you know, one of the, one of the questions is, is, is why, um, and you've probably heard the, the, the spiel, um, but we think that we really are just trying to get nutrient density on the same plane as other um, market drivers in the produce space. So you make a decision about buying a carrot on the basis of its price, on the basis of how it looks, on the basis of how it tastes, and we just want to add one more thing, nutrient density, to that list. Um, and I think a lot of times when we have this conversation, people feel like it is then going to trump all other decisions. It's not. It's just one more item on the list that you will make decisions, purchasing decisions about, and, and that's what it should be. And some people will prioritize it and some people won't. Um, it's not an attempt to have like a gotcha moment on farmers who are doing crappy jobs. It's not, it's none of that. It's just say, let's get nutrient density on the list of things that people can make intelligent choices about when deciding um, which types of produce to buy. So that's really the purpose. Um, and then another question, what do we mean by transparency? So a lot of the times in this campaign that we've talked about building a tool, that's really exciting. It's a great marketing mechanism and there's a there's an important component there. Um, but I think this year we've realized that um, we can bring transparency in a lot of different ways. So we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail, but um, uh, we can bring transparency by more accurately defining based on your location, the store that you're in, the brand, um, what the likely levels of nutrients will be without actually measuring it in the moment, right? So that's another way to bring transparency. Um, so. We can achieve this goal in a lot of different ways and we can take incremental steps towards achieving these goals before we have like a magical million dollar tool. So um, what's the mission of the lab component of the Real Food Campaign? Um, first and foremost, we're really just here to support BF, the BFA and BFA members and the questions that are driven by BFA members. And I, like, I always put that first because um, you know, we spend most of our time like collecting samples and trying to answer sort of a specific question, but really, like we're here to support the people in this room. Uh, that's why we report back at this conference, and it's important. Um, so, if there are things that you want to collaborate on, or things that you want to see or change or come and try, that's that is totally totally what we're supposed to be doing. Um, and then second. We really can't do any of the things that we intend to do without just simply deciding on some standards um, and definitions for things. So um, we have to say, what is nutrient density? It's not really an answerable question. We just have to answer it anyway. Um, um, and we also have to say, how are we gonna collect the, the produce? Or how are we gonna collect the soils? Or how are we gonna process the soil? So there's all kinds of things which impact the outcome that we have to make decisions on um, and uh, 
hopefully that helps build some consistency and some interest from others to really get the thing going. Um, I think there's a lot of stagnation that happens and inaction just from fear of making a decision which is not a perfect one, and we, we absolutely do not have that. We're very good at making imperfect decisions. So methods and standards. Building a public database, um, in order to have transparency, either by letting someone know that this carrot is probably within this range of nutrient density based on some information, or if we build a tool that's going to predict what it is in the moment, both of those things need a pretty significant data set. Um, so either direction you go, you need a big data set. Um, and we think it's really important to have um, that data set be public because we're really trying to establish that the, the, the um, food information space should be public. Um, so that database helps us answer two key questions. How much variation is there in a given crop in nutrient density, and then what's the source of that variation? Um, so it's a lot of data collection, and we do do a lot of data collection. And then ultimately calibrate a low-cost device, or um, really just how do we lower the cost of getting nutrient density information, and how do we um, increase the access? So a device is one way to do that, but there's other ways to do that too. So those are the four main goals of the lab. Um, and so these are just a couple questions we get a lot. So one is like, why, why do we have a lab? So there's lots of ways we could have done this. We could have outsourced um, all of the measurements. We could have tried, we could have spent the last two years digging through existing data to try to pull out information from the literature um, or from large sources like the USDA. Um, so why do we build a lab? First, um, the, type of, the type of questions that, that would really drove this um, weren't well represented in the existing literature. So the USDA does do large-scale um, surveys of food quality, but they do it pretty infrequently. Um, and for most crops, they're only taking 5 or 10 or 15 samples. Um, so it, no one's really asking the very broad question at the tails and at the edges and on a wide variety of farms and stores, how much variation is there? Furthermore. <clears throat> no one's really collecting the additional metadata to understand what the source of that is, and certainly not from the perspective of people in this room. Um, so we needed to have enough control over the process so we could ask the kind of questions that we wanted to ask. Um, in addition, we use a set of methods, um, so, it, so it answers the key objectives that we just laid out. Also, we, we, we really want to put I call it a stake in the ground, or like a flag in the ground. Um, one, on methods, because there's a tendency for people to not move until they have everything perfect. And we got a lot of feedback when we started this that, oh, you know, well, you don't have a definition of nutrition, and so you don't know what that is, so you can't start. Or you don't really know how you're going to get things in, in like, you know, fully freeze-packed packages back to you within 24 hours, so you can't do anything, so you can't start. You know, or, well, these guys already did this, and so you can't start. So there's a lot of reasons why you can't start. Um, so part of it was just starting, putting something out there, getting some data, so that other people in the space could start to come, up, come to us and say, like, hey, we wanted to do that too, but it didn't seem feasible. What have you learned? So that's really important. Um, and then also, from the methods perspective, comparability. So another problem in the space is everyone decides they want to measure different things. And there's good reasons for that in the research space. But when you're trying to build a data set that's going to calibrate a tool and inform the public, you can't go willy-nilly measure everything that you want. <laughs> so um, you just have to decide on which methods you're going to use so that you can have comparability across time and space. Um, and then finally, the, the most important thing I think that we are trying to establish, um, sort of really regardless of where the project goes, is creating a culture of openness in the, um, in the uh, measurement of food quality space. Um, so, you know, in 2003, when you signed up for Facebook and you put in your name and information and you started putting stuff about you and your profile, you didn't realize that 17 years later that would have consequences for elections in the United States, right? You didn't, like, you didn't connect the two. It didn't seem relevant because this information didn't seem relevant yet. And that's the way information goes nowadays. It doesn't seem relevant when it's in pieces, and when you throw it all together, all of a sudden it has, it really drives society in meaningful ways. And we are now in the, 
in the sensor space where we were in 2003 in social media in terms of information. So you're going to start to see immense, immense, immense amounts of information coming both in real-time streams and from individuals on food and food quality, on farms and farm practices, on all kinds of stuff in the world. And if we're not cognizant that we want to make that public and open, then you're going to end up in the same boat that we are with Facebook and Theranos and Cambridge Analytica and all that sort of stuff. So it's really, really, really important early in the stage, early in the space, to stick a flag in the ground and say, if you're talking about food and food information, then you need to make sure that, one, the data set is public, to the tool if you're using one is public and open source, and that the algorithm that you built with that tool on that data set is public and open source, so that if someone wants to fact check the fact that you think dull bananas are the best bananas because your meter says they are, they can go back and figure it out. Um, so it's a, it's a big important piece for us. And then finally, <clears throat> we built a lab because it gave us the flexibility to engage people when and where we wanted to. If we had outsourced the work, um, it would have been more expensive. Um, but also, uh, for example, this year we had someone come up from South America and they tested 250 soils um, use it, using a soil chromatography method and comparing to our, our, um, our processes that we did on soil carbon and other things. Then we were able to do that because we controlled the lab. We could just say, like, yeah, sleep at my house. Like, it won't cost you anything. Just, like, come in and for four weeks and, like, crank on your stuff. Um, so it just gives us flexibility. And then finally, it allows us to develop specific methods. It's just like if you're a farmer and you plant carrots every year, you get really good at planting carrots. We do, like, four methods. We're really good at doing those four methods pretty quickly. So... Um, another question that people ask a lot is like, how does the tool work? <clears throat> uh, and it's important to sort of like understand how it works, dispel some myths, and understand what the concept is. So, um, well, I didn't bring it, but you guys probably seen it. It's out there. So it's a it's a little um, it's like this big, and it fits in your hand, and you put whatever it is you're going to put over it, uh, and it has ten little lights in a very small space, about this big. Um, and the uh, lights flash, they hit the sample or whatever the surface is that you're measuring, and then some of the light gets absorbed, and whatever comes back is what you're measuring. It's called reflectance, um, and it's diffuse reflectance. <clears throat> and this is kind of what it looks like. So these are a whole bunch of spectra from last year's data at different wavelengths. So 365 nanometers is the UV. And 940 nanometers is the near-infrared, so just past red light where you can't see it. So, and all these little blue lines are different spectra from different scans. <clears throat> um, so what can we do and what can't we do with this specific information? This is the tool that we have now. So it's pretty good at identifying compounds that absorb at specific wavelengths. So beta carotene and carrots is a good example. Like carrots are orange because they have beta carotene in them. So it's very clear. More orange, more beta carotene. That's an example where this can work well. Like we can see reflectance in orange. It's just like your eye. Um, and if there's any compounds like that, then that works well. And sometimes you can also see compounds that aren't, uh, don't have color changes like beta carotene because you can detect differences in density. So if I have like uh, just water and I have water with a bunch of sugar in it, that's something that you can see in the near infrared over in like the 850 to 940 range. Or if I have water and then water with alcohol in it, you can see that difference because it creates a density change. So in terms of plants, an example would be I have a high starch potato and a low starch potato, or uh, a high moisture content potato and a low moisture content potato. That's a density change that we can, that we can detect with this. So those are examples of things that we can detect. Examples of things that we can't detect are compounds in relatively small quantities that don't have extremely clear color changes, or for which those color changes are, are swamped by the rest of the object. So, and I think that's where the confusion comes in, um, is being able to say, well, are you seeing antioxidants? No. <laughs> You're just looking at a spectral signature that tends to correlate with a high antioxidant carrot. That's it. There, it is possible to see antioxidants, but not using this wavelength range and not in, in, in complex objects like carrots. So, um, so 
yeah, it's important to understand that. So, and, and you'll see when we talk later about extending this wavelength range and sort of expanding the options in terms of how we can see what we can see, that will help us. This is what we do right now. Um, so, then, so then one would ask, well, how do you relate to antioxidants if you can't see antioxidants? Um, well, think of it this way. So if this is, let's say this is all the carrots. I, I'm sorry, I just use carrots every time. Um, but it could just pick anything. So this is all the carrots in the United States, right? And there's a distribution, right? There's a lot that are similar, and there's some that are out on the tails, very low and very high. So if you said, take the spectrometer and tell me, is this carrot very low, very low in antioxidants, or very high in antioxidants? I would say, I probably can't tell you that. But if you said, this is a carrot from New York State in February from Lucky 7, Bunny Love, and then you said, now, from this population of carrots, does your spectrometer help us determine the high and low values within that population? Yes, that's something that I think we can do. So that's why the metadata for this is really, really critical and why we collected so much data this year from farm and data partners, because in the absence of metadata, using this kind of a prediction process is quite hard to tell you exactly what's going on. Is, that, is there any questions about that? Because this is often a point where people have questions. So. Just stopping and checking. Could you explain why that, why that is necessary? Um, because if we're not looking at antioxidants directly, we're just looking at carrots who happen to be similar, which tend to have similar antioxidants. And um, if, if my starting set is so broad, like all carrots in the United States, there's so many other um, factors that affect that it's hard for a model just based on light to differentiate one to the other. It's like saying, um, it's like saying, oh, I added this amendment versus that amendment in farming and saying, how did that affect your yield? It's just swamped by whether or not it rained in July, right? Like, there were so many other factors that fed into that. And so if you can narrow down the factors and make the population as similar as possible, then the likelihood of being able to see a difference using something like this gets higher. Is that, is that? But what you suggested, carrots from New York City, I mean, some of those could have been shipped in from California. One hundred percent, absolutely. Can you make sure to repeat the question. The I'm sorry. The question was, um, um, why, um, like, why is it that um, that you need that information to get more predictive outputs, basically? Um, yes, but it's still better than not knowing. I mean, you're right, um, but it's still better than not knowing. Yeah. So. The smaller the bucket you can get, the better off you are. And I say bucket, I mean like similar items, you know. Um, any other questions on that? Yeah. 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 Okay. So beta carotene is an example where if you just wanted to measure beta carotene, because it's such a clear color change, that one you, you probably could get a reasonable prediction across the whole population. Okay. It's the stuff that you can't really see. Well, then you're not measuring the thing. You're just looking for similar items, basically. Yeah. And, and Greg, I'm not sure you mentioned the other lab methods that you're doing in conjunction with this that, that's part yeah. of that metadata that might clarify some of that. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Can you repeat which one you said? Sure. So, oh, um, I'm, I'm mic'd also. Oh, you are. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, he said that, um, he, he said to clarify some of the <clears throat> lab methods that we're using to, um, it might be the next slide. Oh, okay. Um, so, the, the, yeah, so we run um, these other methods like antioxidants and polyphenols and minerals in a lab along with measuring the same, like a carrot comes in, we measure it with this tool, um, and then we also actually measure it in the lab using traditional antioxidants and polyphenols like wet chem type methods. And then we build a database of those values, right? And then we say, okay, now, can we build a model that predicts antioxidants from spectral values, right? You build the model. And then you say, here, here's a new spectral value model that you've never seen before. Can you tell me what the antioxidants is? And it's the success of that model in doing that. That's how, that's how useful it is to you. Because we're not going to measure antioxidants on the carrot that you measure on your farm. We're just going to assume that we're right to some degree of confidence based on the model. So, and we'll get into the lab methods in just a little bit. So. So this is another question, like, why no functioning tool today? Um, as I just said, if there's no data, you have no calibration. And if you have no calibration, you have no meter, period. 
Um, there's no magic. You have to have data to calibrate the tool. Um, we did get data last year for carrots and spinach. Um, and um, so we made progress there. Um, but we don't have enough to do a calibration. And that's why this year we expanded the number of samples. And we did a bunch of other things to try to get to that point. Also, in terms of doing this well and doing it efficiently and making it cost effective for the consumer, the more, um, the more we know about exactly which wavelengths and which questions, like New York versus time of year versus bunny love, are important for prediction, um, we can create a, um, a lower cost uh, tool. Like if I ha so for example, you know, what resolution, which crop. So if, if I needed to have a tool that was the, in, the full range from mid-infrared down to UV, and it had to have a very fine resolution, well, that's like a $40,000 benchtop spec. Like, I can't, there's no magic there. You, can't, you can buy one, but you probably won't like lug it to the store. Um, however, if I know, oh, actually, if just these four wavelengths, if we just had these four wavelengths, we'd be 80% accurate. It's like, okay, yeah, we can build a tool on four wavelengths. That's an entirely different strategy. So, and, and we, we stumbled this year on this. Um, I think because we, we tried to go faster than the data would allow us to. Um, but I think it's important to realize that when we have enough information to make appropriate decisions, we will make, we, we will, we will make that tool. And so that's where we're at. That's why the lab is so important. Okay. So let's look at results um, I'll, I'll just a, quickly from last year and then um, this year, and then we'll look forward to um, sort of plans in the future. So um, I, I'm not going to go through details for last year's results. I presented at the conference last year. There's also a final report, um, which is was quite detailed and thorough, hopefully, um, which is on the web. So if you go to realfoodcampaign.org, there's like a drop down that says results. You can go to the final report. Just going to give you the top level details. So, one, we found that there's a lot of variation. There's, there was a surprisingly large amount of variation. So, my example there is like one carrot with high antioxidants from the high end of the spectrum could be equivalent to 30 carrots with an equal amount of antioxidants. So, and that's, you know, that's excluding outliers and stuff. Like, let's say, oh, that, who knows, maybe that was a weird variety or something like that. But even in the sort of core range, there was a lot of variation. And it was not just true for antioxidants and polyphenols, but it was also true for a lot of the minerals. So potassium, there was some that had like 4,000 parts per million and some that had 80,000 parts per million. So a really surprising range. Um, second, the source of that variation was, was basically we were like, ah, we don't know. We asked some fairly simple questions about farm management. Um, we tried to ask questions about variety, but we didn't have a very good setup to do that. Um, and basically, with the limited information that we had, we couldn't make a, a reasonable guess as to where that variation is coming from. And then finally, um, we built the model that I talked about before, predicting you know, antioxidants and polyphenols, for example, from spectral data. And it wasn't good enough to use, but it showed enough promise to try to, try to do it again this year. So that was basically the results from 2018. So we, we did two crops. We did carrots and spinach. We had one lab, the lab in Michigan. We did a total of, we did a little over 800 samples, but only 650 that didn't rot, get screwed up, or some other thing. Um, and so our total cost, if you just look at lab costs, was about $184 per sample. So a sample was actually one food sample and two soil samples. So in 2019, we planned to expand the number of crops to six. So that's lettuce, kale, cherry tomatoes, um, spinach, carrots, and grapes. We brought on, uh, we were, our plan was to bring on a second lab at Chico State with Cindy Daly, if any of you know her, um, and um, so that we could collect, um, uh, have lower our shipping time in the West Coast. Uh, our target was to do 3,000 samples, and our target cost was 60 to $90 per sample. So the actual was, we did get our six crops done, so we had to develop methods for those. Um, we did add our second lab at Chico State, so they're all set up. And in fact, Monday, they're getting their first, like, 50 samples, which is super cool, um, from a research project in South Beach. Long Beach. Long Beach. I always get that mixed up. Uh, Long Beach. 
um, which is really exciting. And um, next year, when we start, they will start with us. So samples on the West Coast will go straight to them. Um, and um, we also, we haven't signed the, the paperwork yet, but it, I'd say at this point, pretty confident. Um, we'll probably be adding another lab in France. So there's a company in France which does um, um, product certification, basically. And they're interested in using this as their standard for a certification mechanism for produce in France, which is also really exciting. We didn't do 3,000 samples. Right now we're at about 1,000. We'll run for another two months, so we'll probably get to about 1,500 samples, um, which is less than we wanted to, um, but I'll tell you why later. And then we, we, did, we were pretty close to our target cost per sample. So um, on net, we were low on total number of samples, but otherwise not bad. In 2018, um, like I said, we, when we collected samples, um, we really asked very basic management questions. We asked, like, are you organic? Are you no-fill? Do you spray? Stuff like that. Um, about 10 options. And so it, we were very limited in how we could analyze the data because we couldn't necessarily connect things. And that was a lot of feedback that we got last year. It was like, well, you're not seeing these differences because you're not collecting good management information. It's totally reasonable. So this year, we created the Farm Partners Program, in which instead of just having people collect samples from stores and farmers markets and going to a farm once or twice, those were actual farmers collecting from their own farm. And because they knew everything that happened to that particular planting, we got everything from, they submitted basically all data about that planting to the point of collection. So. Uh, you know, did you mulch? What kind of seed did you use? We had pre-populated values for um, tillage classes and varieties in the whole nine yards. So our management data this year was a lot better. Um, and we, we actually, and we're going to talk about this later and in the next session you can hear more about it, but we also pushed all of that data to FarmOS, which is a farm management software. So we actually pre-populated individual people's farm management software with the data that we collected through the app for them. And we're really excited about doing more of that because we know that this data collection is time consuming and no one really wants to do it. And so trying to figure out how to lower the pain and increase the value of that process is really important to us. We also got GPS, um, hopefully, in theory, we got GPS data for all the data points. So we can do things like um, if it was on a farm, we can go to the USGS soil database and see what soil type it is, which is pretty interesting and useful for predictions. We also got better varietal data we asked for. Even in farmer's markets, we asked for planting date and harvest date. So we got maturity information, which is important and probably a driver. Uh, and then we also asked people to just eat it and tell us what it tasted like. So we got a little bit of taste information. Obviously, it's going to vary a lot, uh, but we figured we'd get it. So we uh, expanded that a lot. 2018, we did the we did reflectance using our spec, which is in the basically the visible range on the on the surface of the object, and then also afterwards we did an extraction, and we did it on the liquid extraction. Um, we did antioxidants, polyphenols, proteins, and minerals using XRF. So that was what we did in the produce. And then on the soils, there was two horizons. There was a 0 to 6 inch and 6 to 12 inch. And we did reflectance, um, total organic carbon, carbon mineralization, um, which is like a soil respiration test. It's an indication of biological activity in the soil. And then um, Minerals, same thing. So that was last year. This year was fairly similar, but we added a, an expanded spectral range. So you can see our little device does 365 to 940, which is mostly the visible range. And then we got this NeoSpectre device, which expands it way out into the near infrared. And there's a lot of information there, and that's a space that we hope will improve our predictive model. So we're really excited about that. Um, and we, we also felt from last year, we learned that surface scans are just, there's just tons of variability. Like trying to get a consistent surface scan is just, we would need a very significantly different setup to do that well. Um, but at the same time, doing the supernatant, you can't expect people to do an extraction at home necessarily. Um, so this year we kind of split the middle and we decided to do like juice. So we juiced everything and then we also did spectral scans on the juice at all the wavelengths with the hope that, okay, like you can't scan it in the store, but you can at least buy one, take it home, and crush it up. So um, again, we're trying to hedge our bets in terms of what's going to be most effective at doing a prediction. Otherwise, it was pretty similar. We added pH to the soils, and we changed the horizon a little bit, but, um, but fairly similar. Um, I just wanted to walk through. I tried really hard to see if there was anything fun to show you, um, but we're like right in the middle of the season. So like, we have about 1,000 samples um, submitted, but they're at various stages in the 
collection process. And so um, I'm just going to show you um, kind of what, what uh, the basics of what it looks like. Um, so if you go to, is there, who's was a farm partner in the room? So you got an uh, email, which I think Dan probably just re-emailed you yesterday, or a lot of you anyway, which has a link to the dashboard which contains your data. I feel good about that because it took us until about March last year when we got that, so we're like ahead of the game. So what that's going to look like is this is just going to be a big table, um, and this is, oops, and it has all the data in it. This is, this is just me getting it ready for this conference. It'll look a little bit nicer when you get it, but you can see um, it's got, you know, for the zero to ten soil high, r r r horizon, it has the respiration data, the organic matter, the total carbon, all of your minerals from sodium, which isn't very good, but up to um, nickel and copper and zinc. And also for the second horizon, and then polyphenols, antioxidants, along with the rest of the information. What's cool this year, and again, um, I pretend to be a programmer, so I make things, but they look terrible, is um, we've got um, percentile ranges um, for all of your data now. So let's take antioxidants. So these are the antioxidants level for the, for the various crops. I don't know what these are. It says over in the corner if it's like a carrot or spinach or whatever. That value means you're in the 36th percentile for that crop. So it's telling you for that crop, not for the whole population. So this is a 36th percentile carrot or whatever. I don't know what it is. But that, you know, it's, that's what people really want to know. They want to know relative to other similar things, where am I at in terms of this particular nutrient value. Um, or maybe what we could do is we could do percentiles based on crops, and then we could provide you with an additional table that shows the the the, the min, max, and average for each of those subclasses, and then you could go and look and be like, oh, okay, here's how I fit. Because there's going to be a lot of those classes, you know. Uh, we'd love feedback, and at the end of this, like, lots and lots of feedback on how to visualize this, how you want to see it, all that jazz. So that's that. And then you can also go... Um, this is, if you clicked on the share code that you got as a farmer, you will go to this and you'll see just your data. Um, but if um, you didn't click on that link and you just go to the normal dashboard, you will see, um, you'll see this, which contains all the data. So you can see there's 1,080 entries and it contains the store name and the brand and, uh, and all that other stuff. Uh, you can also download the data as a CSV. You know, we have a, just starting to get visualizations, but it's kind of cool because this map last year was really just a map of like the Northeast. And we added a lot of states this year. So it's, it's, we're getting there. It's broader. And then you can kind of see here some of the distributions, but we don't really need to go into it. But I, I looked at it yesterday. It's fairly similar to last year. The, the, the variation's a little bit less. Things are a little tighter, but also we don't have that much data. So, um, cause it's coming in as it gets processed from the freezer. Um, any questions about the, the, I know that's the most interesting part. I just, I wish I had more for you on that, but. Yes, what was the soil respiration method that we use? It's, a, it's called the 24-hour burst method. It's similar. It's, it's the same as Solvita, yeah, except it doesn't cost anything. Okay, so additional work. So this is, these are some of the reasons. My, this is my list of excuses why we didn't get to 3,000 samples. Ready? So first off, we had to develop an entirely new program. So the Farm Partners Program was entirely new. We, had, we created how many questions were in that survey? Yeah, 100 to 150. We had two different surveys. Um, it was quite long and complex, and it was a lot of programming. We also had to connect to Pharma West and push all that data, so there was a lot of development work there, and there was a lot of testing. And so it just, it just was time consuming, but definitely worthwhile. Um, obviously, we uh, expanded a lab, so they came out and trained with us. We went out and trained with them. We bought a bunch of equipment for them. We shipped it out, um, so that was time consuming. Um, we also worked on the Open Team application with Dorn and had a significant part in that, which took a lot of time in writing. But the result of that was that we were successfully funded, and a lot of, we had $200,000 worth of software work in the budget, which we, we were able to offset through Open Team, through contributions into Open Team, which then resulted in returns back. So that was definitely worthwhile and would have been really expensive to do within the RFC alone. We also shipped 160 by nutrient meters, so that's cool. Uh, and then we had our residency this year, and I, I really, really, really would love to do more of these. And if you know anyone who's interested, really in any way, we're super, super excited about residencies. And this year, um, Leandro Mastrantonio from Argentina came up and tested. Um, he basically took our samples and ran soil chromatography, which is, that's what those pictures are. Is anybody, are you guys familiar with that? It's really, it's really interesting. You take, you basically, simplifying, Mix soil with water um, with <clears throat> silver nitrate, which is you know what you use to expose films, and you let the 
soil water mix wick up into a round sheet like that. Those are on like round piece of filter paper, and, and the water wicks up from the middle, and as it passes through the filter paper, the, the lighter particles go further, and the heavier particles don't go as far. And then the silver nitrate reacts with organic compounds, and will, like a, like a piece of film, they'll develop. And so you end up with this uh, chromatographic method that's really unique and interesting and pretty and complicated, um, but contains a lot of information in it. And so you'll see this a lot in the um, permaculture community, and people are kind of interpreting it. It's a little bit like tea leaf reading. But um, what we wanted to do was try to take our samples where we had lab data and see if we could use a machine learning model to, to take that image and correlate it to lab data. Um, so he's still working on that. Um, it, was, it was really fun. It was fun to have him there. Um, and so hopefully we can do more of that. OK. So 2020 plans. So we're going to keep up with the survey that we've got. Um, we're going to try really hard by the end of this year to update the existing devices to give you a like a high, medium, low prediction on at least one of the nutritional parameters. Can't guarantee it. Depends on what the data says and how much we get. But we are going to try to do that. Regardless, in 2020, we're going to try to do that either through the device or through an app or through just information about specific products and locations and other things that I described before. Again, informing both consumers and farmers. We, you know, I love the tool that we have, but it's a big wide world and there's lots of people who make tools. So we've been interacting with more people who want to calibrate their tool in our sample process. It, it's really, we're really unique in that way. There's a lot of people who make tools and they have no idea where and how to calibrate it. So we can say, hey, if you give it to us, we'll run it. Well, when the carrots come in, we'll, we'll run it when the carrots come in, and then you'll have a nice public database. So maybe the technology itself isn't open source, but at least the, the database and the algorithms um, on top of that can be. So we're really trying to partner with folks to do that. And then figure out which of those pieces of information, whether that be which wavelengths, which pieces of metadata, um, are critical for um, providing that transparency, for providing the best prediction possible because we don't really know what that is yet. Uh, second thing we want to do in 2020 is expand the number of labs. So it helps with geographic impact, increase our number of samples. We have to throughput it all in Michigan in our current lab, and, and actually it decreased our sample costs. So what we do is we try to find partners who are independently motivated. We'll cover their um, consumables, which you know maybe that's 20 or $25, but then they have to cover their own labor. And that's like 35 or $40. The majority of the cost is labor, actually. Um, which means that it's actually cheaper for us to run samples at Chico than it is to run it ourselves, which is really great. And the reason is because um, they have their own separate interests. So they want to publish. That has value to them. They want to train students. That has value to them. Um, so they're willing to take on those costs. So really excited about that. And also, we just want to diversify expertise. So Chico say is a good example. They have local partners who are interested in almonds. It's like, great. Like, they want to spend the winter making a process and method for almonds. And when they do, we can use it, and the lab in France can use it. So by diversifying expertise, we can be stronger. We can do cross-check programs to, to reduce noise and ensure comparability and things like that. So I'm super excited about that. Obviously, expanding number of crops is just a necessity. Um, I, think, I think we've gotten smart enough where we can onboard a new crop a little bit faster and more efficiently now. Improving our data and farm partners programs. We want as much geographic diversity as possible, trying to deliver as much value back to those folks as possible so that it, they're motivated and not just that we're having to ask for something, but they're actually delivering value. And then hopefully we're just going to start work, work with Next7 um, to do a more like citizen science approach to the data partner program um, where we've got more highly trained individuals who are more highly motivated in areas um, to get better quality and more consistent samples. And then um, just better outreach and communication as you can see, our visualization skills are not top-notch. Um, like, we can get it out. We can get it in a table. Um, but we really love to have somebody who's good at um, visualizations in JavaScript. And also, a big piece of feedback that we got last year was um, people, people want to use their phones that they're used to to collect their data. And if you try to make them use another phone, they will yell at you. So um, just we, we just we got to solve the problem. It's not really what we want to be doing this winter, but it's what we're going to be doing this winter. Uh, and then getting more peer-reviewed publications, because it does matter. Peer review matters. Um, we're not paid to, to get peer-reviewed publications. Thankfully, I don't really want to. But, um, but there are now people in the network who are motivated for that. So we're excited to get that out there and 
gain legitimacy within the scientific community. And yeah, that's it. You can get involved lots of ways. You can buy a bionutrient meter, but you probably shouldn't. You should probably just donate. So if you're thinking about buying one, first think hard about donating. And then if you're really geeky and tech savvy and you really want to do it, go get one. Um, you can become a data partner or you can talk with Next7. Um, they do the citizen science thing. Collect. It's just like one package of carrots a week. It's not just carrots, but it's not that hard. Or you can do one or two Saturdays throughout the season and just do a whole bunch at once. So that you've got options in terms of how you can engage. If you're a farmer, you can become a farm partner. Um, we'll do the testing for free and deliver the results back to you. Um, if you work at a university, there might be ways that we can partner or at a company or a nonprofit. And then um, if you want to do a residency and come stay at my house and hang out at the lab for four weeks, you can do that too. So lots of ways to interact. Uh, the second, we can talk about that now if you're not going to be in the second session, but the second session is like all that. It's just feedback about farm and data partners program and discussions about how we can best communicate information and and um, deliver results and information back to farms and farmers. So, and I want to make sure Doran has time. So, that's my spiel. That's yeah, actually a pretty good lead-in. Yeah, <laughs> it is a great lead-in. Yeah. So, um, so Doran Cox uh, is the the principal investigator for the the Open Team project, which is really about connecting, um, creating an uh, open source ag tech ecosystem, so that we can do like kind of what you're talking about, delivering as much value to people at the lowest possible cost. And there's just a lot of technical development in that. And there's a lot of value that can be returned to the to the BFA community as well through that. So, uh, you know, I'm happy to uh, talk a little bit about Open Team and the context of the real food campaign within Open Team. It's uh, a lot of the questions and the, the systems that, uh, that the real food campaign is developing are really similar to a lot of other questions that we're trying to ask about agriculture. And so Open Team is really an, uh, a, well, the, the acronym is Open uh, Technology Ecosystem for Agricultural Management. And ecosystem is a really important word because it's not just the technologies, it's those communities and how we work together to create something that's actually useful at the farm level. And it's also part of a, a sort of a growing recognition that agriculture is a system science and it's a shared science, it's a public science, it's something that we all have an interest in, not just the farmers, but the general uh, community uh, that is involved in, uh, uh, in that food system. And so I think the Real Food Campaign is one expression of that, is like we care about it. We're asking agriculture for a lot more. It's not just about calories, how to feed the world. We're asking for health, we're asking for environmental services, we're asking for uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation and water quality, quantity. We're dealing with agriculture as a means to control wildfires. All of these things are sort of byproducts of what we're asking from agriculture. And we have a lot of tools. We have a, really lo a lot of really complex tools that are becoming more and more accessible, but how do we actually make those useful? And you heard, you know, uh, uh, the Real Food Campaign is one expression of that. Um, but a lot of the, the challenges that uh, it takes to answer some of those questions are the same challenges that we, that we can address in lots of other areas of the, uh, of, uh, uh, in, in agriculture. Um, so, uh, I, a number of you may have been here last year and saw a presentation about <laughs> about this. Uh, the uh, we're there, there are really three uh, three main areas uh, with within Open Team. One is the technology and how those pieces work together, and creating a community around that and making sure that we are actually working at a systems level. But like I said, agriculture. In order, to, the, our understanding of agriculture is only useful if it's actually applied. And agriculture is incredibly diverse in terms of where it, it happens everywhere on Earth, uh, and it's incredibly specific to those local production systems. And so we need to also connect our technology to that localization. So it's it's also the same. So we're dealing with everything from the microbiome to the biosphere in terms of what we're asking for. And so Open Team is really connecting that. And so it has to happen on site. So we're building in 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 addition to connecting technologies together, we're also connecting farmer networks together uh, that represent diverse production systems, scales, geographies. Uh, in ways in which we use that uh, technology. And, and the third area is that we, we're developing a human-centered design 
connection, essentially, that in order for the technology to be useful, we need to actually design for all those uh, unique production systems. Since we met last, uh, last year, we have gone from sort of uh, organizing this ecosystem and community to launching it. Uh, and so, and in that process, we're uh, bringing in a, a lot of uh, new partners and we're continuing to add them. But I'll show you a very short film uh, that I think sort of captures uh, sort of the maturity of the project. And then um, I'll give you a few examples. Climate change is threatening the future of life on Earth. Today, agriculture is the source of as much as 20% of the gases that cause global warming. The good news? We now know agriculture can help flip this around and help make extreme climate change history. The solution lies in the soil. When farmers grow healthier soil, they remove carbon dioxide, the primary gas responsible for global warming from the atmosphere, and capture and store that carbon in the soil by increasing living roots, microbial diversity, and stable organic matter. Removing carbon can have a huge impact on slowing climate change. That is why we're launching Open Team. Open Technology Ecosystem for Agricultural Management. Open Team's vision is to provide everyone, everywhere, access to the best agricultural knowledge. Because we now know that we can improve soil health faster than we ever thought possible. Led by Stonyfield, Wolf's Next Center for Agriculture and the Environment, the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research, and the USDA's Land PKS, we're bringing together a dream team of farmers, universities, food companies, and cutting-edge technologists working collaboratively to give farmers easier access to existing tools, to develop new tools for improving soil health, and to create an open source digital platform to share knowledge and innovation. This will help a growing network of farmers anywhere in the world make better decisions about how to improve soil health. Healthy soil grows healthier and more nutritious crops. Healthy soil reduces the use of costly fertilizers, saving farmers money. Healthy soil preserves precious resources like water. And healthy soil retains more water, so it makes farmland more resistant to extreme weather like drought or flooding. With Open Team, agriculture can now move from climate change problem to climate change solution. And farmers with their supporting communities around the globe can now become the new climate heroes. Creating and nurturing healthy soil is a win-win-win. For farmers, for all of us, and for the planet. The, the film is really focused on, uh, on climate, but the processes and the tools and the communities that are addressing those are directly related to uh, the same kinds of questions and the participatory science uh, that is also going to be advancing uh, the kinds of uh, campaigns like the Real Food Campaign. So I think, so in, the, in, in, sort of in a nutshell, I want to present Open Team as an opportunity uh, and sort of to broaden the coalition and to uh, expand the conversation and also the context in which uh, future sort of uh, questions and participation uh, is taking place. So we have, uh, I think, a, a mainstreaming in terms of interest and participation in, uh, in, in creating some of these open source tools and asking things on a systems level. Uh, this afternoon you're going to talk a little bit, or the next session talk a lot more uh, about sort of the, the, the actual participate, uh, participatory process of getting data in to make these systems work. Um, and I'll just briefly go through, that. that's a, a big part of what the Open Team is about, is building those systems so we can create data portability and, and uh, give farmers control of their own data so that by entering it once uh, and creating value in entering it, say for organic certification or for GAP certification, we can use that same data to autofill a lot of these same other reports to be able to use it for research, uh, but also uh, pull in data that we're already entering for USDA uh, and also autofill uh, and uh, qualify for USDA programs and then also create new uh, new financial products based on that data, but fundamentally it's really about exchanging and connecting farmers and this, uh, this shared enterprise in, 
receiving and sharing information and inspiration is building networks where we're seeing the results of our efforts together. So we've, in the last year, we've uh, created core connectivity between functional groups that have traditionally not worked uh, together, from observation tools uh, that you hear a lot, uh, that uh, Greg and the RSI team is particularly involved with, with PharmaOS, but also with remote sensing uh, uh, um, uh, uh, organizations, so linking the ground truthing that we need for satellite uh, imagery and doing uh, agroecosystem models and creating collaboration and multi-model comparison, but ultimately bringing that back to decision tools that we can use uh, on the ground to improve our on-farm decision making. Um, and you'll see in terms of the representation and the membership of Open Team, which is expanding, that we have uh, diverse representation. Again, it's not just research uh, universities, it's not just food companies, it's uh, uh, not just uh, uh, technical uh, technology startups, uh, it's not just foundations, we're all in this together, and so we're starting uh, to build a culture and set the norms for how we actually do that and link our in-field measurements uh, with management and then tie that in again to from, micro, from uh, microbiome to biosphere and start to draw uh, broader conclusions. I mean, we don't have to get into it uh, much right now, but it is remarkable that the lab-based methodologies for calibrating and validating that, uh, that uh, Greg just talked about in the lab is a very similar process that we're doing at the, at the, uh, at the field level, at the watershed level, at the national level, and at the global level. So a lot of the same types of things, and they all uh, stitch in together. Um, and so we're, uh, Optus, for example, is in the process. They just finished a study where they can remotely measure field boundaries and uh, cover emergent states, uh, species type, and uh, tillage practices, and, uh, and uh, cover, yeah, uh, acres and cover crops uh, remotely. And this is part of where we can do this. It's very expensive to do the kind of work that we're doing in the field to gather all this. It's very inexpensive to analyze it, but without the calibration that's happening on the ground and the kind of data that we're collecting at the farm, we can't actually gather that efficiently. Um, and I'll just skip over this for, for now, because, but I'll, uh, uh, I'll just say a couple words in that the farm level data that we're using to create value uh, in our products in terms of nutrient density, that same data, as I've said before, is the same data that we need for research and development. It has value uh, that can be recognized at, at the farm level. It's the same data that we need to make claims and pay premiums uh, for the food, either at the farmer's market or in the grocery store or at the commodity level. Uh, and that has additional value, and it's the same data that we can use to create new products to value uh, not just soil carbon, but also in, uh, other environmental services like biodiversity and water quality and quantity that are outputs and that we can also value. But in order to do that, we need to have greater confidence in the data, and so that's where Open Team comes in, this intersection between at the farm level and asking basic research questions and creating trust and partnerships between farmers and researchers. All the rest is wonderful and we want to see lots of innovation built on top of that, but in order those, we have to do this work as a prerequisite for all of that uh, opportunity uh, to become possible. And so I'll just root it in, uh, in that we have this, the potential to use the incredible biodiversity that's, uh, that's been created over millions and millions of years uh, that we're beginning to unlock uh, with genomics and so forth, as well as new soils indicators, uh, and share that uh, across our network that's only maybe 5,000 days old, uh, where we're connecting to one another through the internet. So millions of years, 5,000 days old. What can we do in the next 5,000 days what can, to transform our, our soils together and ask all these different services and questions. More nutrient-dense food, better climate, more access to uh, and creation of abundance, because I think it's all this shared system science. So I'll leave it at that, and uh, oh, happy to answer questions. Yeah, and, and I think it's, it's a cultural transformation that we're seeing in terms of understanding this kind of agricultural science is that as a systems level, we have to collaborate in order to get to the next level of understanding. But it's also moving, as we move towards a more regenerative agricultural system, 
the culture of agriculture is different that supports a regenerative system. It has to be more collaborative. It is more complex. It's more knowledge-based. And it's focused on abundance rather than scarcity. We're valuing the, it, the, not just the food outputs. We're valuing all these other outputs, which we actually, and when we talk about soil health or, or health of the, the, the climate, or there's an unlimited, there's, it's, it's not a scarce resource. We can, have, we can actually drive towards abundance, which creates a very different set of motivations. Uh, in terms of uh, creating those outcomes. And so the incentive to share when we have an unlimited upside is very different. And so we're trying to create software systems and cultural systems that support that, uh, that model. Uh, so we move from a agriculture that's based on industrial scarcity system, based, again, based on scarce inputs, towards something that uh, is based on knowledge, and which is a non-rival good, which means that if I share it with you, that it doesn't diminish uh, my use of it at all. In fact, it increases it because you're going to use it and improve it and, and, and send it back in a better state. And the soil is the same way. Uh, and so I think that's the, that's, there's a big shift that we're, we're, we're trying to tap into and create new, financial, uh, new incentives for that so that we can move towards the, the new model. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I, I, I did have, I'll, I'll show you, this is, this is just to show some of that complexity. <laughs> so that nice little loop there is actually, this is the, the community starting to map to itself. And that's a lot of what Greg and I are, and our community and, and Mike here are all working on is like actually creating this incredible network uh, together that, you know, it will, it will look, I think when we complete this process, it will be just as complex as the fungal root networks. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we certainly don't want it to be, you know, like, we yeah, want, we, you know, you have to have the Apple experience with all of the complexity of the same. It's like not, it's not easy to do, but we will get there, and like, that's why that feedback is so important. And we can solve a lot of technical problems. We have to prioritize them based on what's possible. And, and, and stuff, but um, yeah, we're super excited about doing that. And and what this can, this is like, I feel like I find this really confusing until you think about what this actually is, you know? So like, if you trace a line, it would be like, um, like an analog that I think is relevant for this community. So let's say, let's say John Kemp, right? So everybody loves his method, that's awesome. But it's complicated, you have to talk to someone, there's a lot of information that he requires, there's calculations that happen, like any of those things. So imagine if one of these lines is, you have a farm management system, right? And John Kemp loads your information from that system, and now he has what he needs, you know? He asks maybe two or three additional questions. Now that gets sent off to something that runs an algorithm, which is essentially a tree-based model for making the best estimate for what it is that you need based on your actual information, right? That model outputs back to you, to your farm management system, and creates a set of recommendations for what you should be doing. It creates, like, on October 10th, you should do this. And you can see that and visualize it. You can go, like, oh, yeah, no, I do want to do that. Or you can say, like, oh, that's not going to work. Thank you. Right? It's not about being prescriptive. It's just about being informative and then people going from there. So when you see those lines, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about data and information moving from one place to another to another to another who has the expertise to get what it is that you yeah. ultimately want back out. And that's your phone is doing it all day long. You, like your yeah. phone is talking to 100 million different things all day long. We're just trying to get to the, the first babyest step yeah. of that tax space. So, yeah. But every, every line there is essentially a relationship and a trust and an agreement to exchange. And so that's part of this eco ecosystem sort of approach is that we're creating those, the, those linkages and that, that often in, in cases haven't been there. And so we're trying to create the, the community communication that allows for that exchange uh, to happen. So the question is, uh, USDA is part of the Open Team ecosystem uh, as one of the governmental uh, partners. And we're working both with NRCS as well as ARS uh, and, and uh, and several other agencies as well are related. What's really remarkable in this uh, political environment is that the soil health conversation is not political. Uh, conservation title was not touched. We have one of the most progressive farm bills passed in history in 2018. 
Uh, and we had, under this administration, passed by Paul Ryan, the Open Government uh, Data Act. Uh, which is requiring U.S. Uh, government agencies to publish their data in electronic readable formats. So a lot of that work is happening previously, but this, for whatever reason, is staying out of uh, the political debate and is actually moving forward. Uh, and uh, there's a great deal of support, again, bipartisan support for improved soil health. And I think it's partly uh, be because it's being shown to have economic benefit, it works, it's, it, so it's just not controversial. We have, and sort of the interesting position we find ourselves by, you know, coming from sort of the regenerative organic side is that there's large, there's support in this direction at all scales across agriculture, which is part of the strength and part of the sort of the interesting <laughs> position we find ourselves in. I was talking to like a policy person um, and uh, their, their reference was like, you know, the U.S. military, you know, which spends half a trillion dollars every year, is threatened by global climate change. They have multiple bases on the coast, which, you know, there's sea level change that's a couple hundred million dollars down the drain and all this kind of stuff, right? So they, so and they're very practical. They're just no BS. They just look at the data and say, well, we're going to lose this space. We better do something about it. You know? So, like, they get pushed. So that if you're a politician and you're, you know, real conservative and you hear some liberal say, like, something about soil health and you want to poo poo it. And then you show up on the military committee, and the military's like, hey, we need like, we need a billion dollars. Yeah, and I, th I think there's another cultural aspect that's changed because it's being framed as uh, both, bo both in soil health, uh, in, uh, in that it's outcome based rather than prescriptive. It's not about values, it's about what we agree on in terms of what we want as an outcome. That's not controversial. How we get there and what kind of incentives we use. That's where we've gotten into sort of more of the, the, the political uh, divides. Uh, and I think that's part of the strategy too, uh, is to break, is to create uh, outcome-based projects that allow for innovation and creativity uh, rather than, again, prescriptive policy, policies. Um, and, uh, and, and so we're even seeing that in, in, in the regenerative agriculture and why I personally am pushing very strongly towards it being an outcome-based measurement rather than something like organic certification. Yeah. Because if we set these as goals, we, what we want is that our businesses to profit by improving the environment rather than degrading it. I think most people would agree with that. Now we can agree, okay, if we agree on that, how do we measure it? Let's collaborate on that. And then if you think that just straight no-till and roundup is the way to do it and we can measure that, okay, Fine. Let's also measure all these other things in terms of health outcomes and environmental and water quality and everything else that's going on in the system. And we have, we have no barriers to that because we're actually talking about how does this, what are the outcomes and, that we're measuring. Um, but, we, but we can move towards having, let's have a bigger conversation rather than a narrower conversation. So that's a long answer, but the, it's a really important question in terms of how, how this moves forward to a broader audience and political barriers. So my, my short answer is that I think we're, I think through a lot of experience, and uh, uh, this is one of the things that's broken through because and become and isn't politically divisive at this moment. And we have to be really careful about that. You know, the BFA is a, and Dan especially, he's like, he's an opinionated fellow. Um, and, uh, and so we've had to go back and forth a lot about um, how much of that opinion and perspective do you bring into the real food campaign, especially into the lab space. And I think, you know, we've decided it's just not a good idea to do it because you, for all the reasons that it's just described. And it's not to say you can't then go out and have an opinion about it and push an opinion. Just when you're talking about the measurement, you focus on the measurement. Your, your, your ability to impact is that. Well, if not, I want to plug. Then our, so our next session, we're going to be talking specifically about the Farm and Data Partners programs, what can that look like, what we learn, and we am sure there's a lot of things. Um, and then also just like, we know that this community is a lot of small to medium sized, especially diversified farmers who don't really want to use technology, aren't particularly interested in it, and frankly wouldn't benefit that much from it. We're not stupid. Um, but we would love to hear your feedback on um, how that can be less costly and more valuable to you. And think, you know, think far and wide. Like, think like, um, think in magic land, you know, when you can talk to your phone and don't understand you and don't know what you did, or maybe, you know, whatever. Uh,
for you. You connect to your brain, and your brain just directly outputs to the database. Like, I would love to hear any and all wacky ideas that you have. Or, um, you know, again, like, you know, uh, you can translate a method from somebody else who you really respect to your farm with no effort somehow. With con in context, in all appropriate context, or or whatever. Um, we just we really want to hear that because it's important. We're not, we're not doing the work. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.